People have been trying to keep malevolent spirits out of their homes for centuries, and in many ways this gave rise to the form of magic known as apotropaic magic. But what exactly did it involve, and what kind of items might you use to protect your home? Find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I hope this finds you well for our first episode in February 2021. I'm not even going to bother with any kind of preamble because there's not really anything that I need to say other than this is going to be a little bit more of a bumper episode, which is another reason why I want to get into it a little bit more quickly. Because when I started researching this, I had one idea of where it was going to go and then it kind of wandered off in this other direction as research often does and speaking of research if ever you're wondering where all my different sources are from or where I get the research from or you'd like to follow up with further reading then obviously you can follow the link to the blog post in the show notes and then you'll find all of the links to the various books and what have you that I've been using or websites and journals etc etc so if you are ever interested in doing your own research off the back of any of these episodes then that's where all the information is kept I don't bother putting it in the show notes just because I figure that's a bit redundant if it's already on the blog post so there we go I do have some images as well for this one which again you can find on the blog post. So we are looking at home protection the folklore way and just before I start I should remind you that if you are interested in this then I do actually have a free pdf guide that you can get from my website if you sign up for my email list. Now I know email lists sometimes get a little bit of a bad rap because people obviously use them to kind of just spam you with stuff for sale I literally send an email once a week or you can choose the monthly digest if you prefer so you know when these blog posts and podcast episodes go live and I will sometimes send links about other events that I'm doing. There's no kind of like bye 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 kind of stuff because let's be honest that's just not really my style. So if you are interested in learning a bit more about home protection using different folkloric methods then you can check that out for free by signing up from the link below where it says grab your guide to home protection. And obviously as a caveat I would still recommend a burglar alarm at the very least. So if anyone decides that they're going to use these methods instead of technology then that is entirely up to you and I'm not to be held responsible. That caveat out of the way. Let's get on with this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. So people have been trying to stop malevolent spirits getting into their homes for literally centuries and the ways that they've done this have really ranged from planting rowan trees by the door to keep witches out which obviously we did a few weeks ago. They hung horseshoes above the door to keep evil out which again we looked at in the horseshoes episode with blacksmiths and people have basically used this huge range of protective devices and it's known as apotropaic magic and these items are essentially the first line of home protection defence against both the dark arts and rogue evil spirits. Now our anxieties about the home might involve a break-in or in certain parts of the UK flooding And it's hard to imagine other earlier fears about fairies or witches or other evil spirits and whatnot gaining access to the home. Now I'm not going to look at witch bottles in this episode because there is an episode specifically on them and I have put the link to that in the show notes. And obviously I'm not going to look at things like Rowan and Elder because again there's already episodes on that and I wanted to give you like new content. So what we're going to have a look at is what people actually did indoors and they're not necessarily like magical in the same way but they do sort of present a bit of a ritual reason for using them although there's no real records to say what these things are so we are kind of just guessing. So we are going to have a look at how people protected their homes on a spiritual level as far as we can deduce based on the marks and items that they left behind around their homes. We're going to have a look to start off with about why there was a need for home protection in the first place and the development of the home as a building really did change patterns of living as new rooms allowed for new functions and there's an excellent book by Lucy Worsley called If Walls Could Talk that does kind of talk about the addition of new rooms and so on that I highly recommend. 
But such developments also changed how people related to both the natural and the supernatural world. So the house basically ended up with vulnerable points, such as keyholes, chimneys or front doors. And obviously you can block up keyholes by putting keys in them, and obviously front doors you can lock, but chimneys are kind of always permanently open to the element. So you can imagine that there was a real need to protect that as like an entry point into the home. And it wasn't uncommon for people to hang a broomstick or a horseshoe above the door to keep evil spirits out. And elsewhere, people might also do things like lay crossed objects like knives or brooms on the floor in front of the door to keep witches at bay. I'm going to assume that was more of a temporary measure than a permanent one because otherwise you'd be forever tripping over stuff. But people often considered themselves most vulnerable in their bedrooms, which I'm sure we can all kind of understand on some level, because this is the place where we sleep and dream. And depending on what kind of methods of thought you subscribe to, it's kind of the place in the house where you're not necessarily always a completely cognizant inhabitant of your body. So people might hang horseshoes at the foot of the bed to ward off danger and other people might put apotropaic items at the head of the bed in the roof space or under their pillow and Bibles were quite common under pillows because obviously they were relatively easy to, to place there. And incidentally, a rudimentary doll turned up with pages from the Bible in the plaster at a house in Anstruther in Scotland. I am going to explain what apotropaic means in a minute as well. Some items actually turn up in what is called a spiritual midden, which is a term coined by Timothy Easton. And these are really quite big collections and they're often found in the voids near chimneys. And there is a difference between the spiritual midden and a ritual concealment in that a ritual concealment is like one cache of items that is put in the wall or wherever it might be in one go, whereas a spiritual midden is a large collection that's created at first, but then people continue to add to them over time. Midden, in case you're not familiar with the word, is basically like a form of trash heap or waste heap. So a midden, in usual parlance, is like the toilet. So you can you can sort of say it's basically like a trash heap, but of, you know, collections of things that might be used for spiritual reasons. Now, some of them have actually been found to contain written documents, which does make the contents a bit more personal. But these tend to date to the 19th century when literacy rates were higher, although documents have been found from earlier centuries, according to Easton. Now, the contents in a spiritual midden, they're always really worn out. They're usually broken down in some ways. Nothing's ever brand new. And Easton thinks that the difficulty required in actually accessing the middens because it did mean going up to the very top of the house because there are essentially these voids alongside the chimney behind the walls. And they're obviously quite deep, so you have to go quite high up in the house in order to access them. And the fact that it would be a bit of a faff to get to wherever you were going to access them meant that if you were depositing items in there, it wasn't like just a common or garden rubbish tip where you were just throwing things in willy-nilly. You were having to make a special trip to that part of the house. So it does demonstrate perhaps a genuine anxiety that you were trying to assuage by putting these items in there. He does note that people may have used them like spirit traps, so spirits would head for the cast off garments and old items instead of the family members they represented, or they may have acted as a way to remember family members through their continued presence in the midden via their belongings. And like the other practices that we're going to discuss in this episode, we don't really know why people made them and we won't until more research is done. Now, we are going to come on to this idea about people leaving traces on things later on, but some of it does seem to follow the principle that obviously if you own something, you kind of imprint something of yourself on it. So therefore, that's how you would then remain in the building even after you'd passed on because obviously you'd left traces of yourself on your items and that again is why it would work as a spirit trap. So you've obviously heard me say the word apotropaic several times now and I'm not going to lie it is a really horrible word to try and type because I always type it wrong. But the word apotropaic comes from the Greek term apotropine, meaning to turn away. So it's basically a defence of some way where you're turning away something that is coming towards you. So a really common form of apotropaic defence is the so-called witch mark. Not to be confused with the witch's mark that witches allegedly held on their body somewhere which marked them out as being a witch. These are marks that people made to apparently deter witches. That being said, Owen Davies and Kerry Holbrook do point out that there's actually no real evidence that people intended them to solely deter witches and they were more just general protection devices. 
So these marks have been quite commonly found in medieval buildings, including barns, churches and houses. And they tend to survive because people carve them into woodwork or stone near entrance points like fireplaces or doors. So they tend to be the bits of the building that you kind of you still see or you come across a little bit more easily. So why would you mark them on fireplaces or doors? Ultimately because they are thresholds. So they're the vulnerable parts of the home. So as a result, that's where you would put your protective devices. I mean, you get that with smart home technology now when you can get like smart sensors to go on your windows and your doors and smart locks and all that jazz. You put them on the vulnerable parts of the home. So obviously, if you think about it, if you guard those parts of the house, that should, in theory, prevent evil from entering your home. Now, some people have said, how do we know that they are actually apotropaic marks? How do we know that they're not just mis- like mason's marks or apprentice marks or whatever? And some of them sit individually so that they don't really seem to belong to anyone or anything. And some of them have been made in quite a crude, almost hurried way. Unlike the little bit more careful and considered marks that you would get of a mason or carpenter. And some of them as well, it's like where you find them, it's really unlikely that that would be a mark made by a craftsperson. You do sometimes find burn marks on timbers, which have been made using candles. And Davies and Hulbrook do point out that because of experimental archaeology, we do know that these are nigh on impossible to make by accident. So it's far more likely that they've been made in a deliberate del- it's far more likely that they've been made in a deliberate way. They're sometimes found on chimney posts and things like that out of wood. So it is possible that they were actually a form of sympathetic magic to guard against fire. Apotropaic marks have also been discovered in churches and also far more unusual places like Cresswell Crags, where I did a talk with them at Christmas, you might remember, which does feel like it was about six years ago. And the making of these marks doesn't appear in the historical record, so unfortunately much of what we know about them does come from deduction from those studying them. And this is a problem that folklorists often run into, that we can only really draw conclusions from things that have been done often enough to leave a pattern in the archaeological record. And obviously if you do something often enough in order to leave a a, a mark of some description, that does hint at some kind of ritual or repeated purpose. So obviously from there you can kind of go, ooh, was it for some kind of supernatural reason? So who might you turn to for help in either containing evil or driving it away altogether? One of the best figures that you would turn to in this situation is the Virgin Mary. And you do often find the common mark of the conjoined V, which does look a lot like a W. And it is often believed to mean Virgin of Virgins. And it's possible that people did intend these marks to ask the Virgin to protect the location of the marks. But in his talk about witch marks with Treadwell's bookshop, archaeologist and apotropaic mark expert Wayne Perkins did actually raise the possibility that people used ciphers for the Virgin Mary during a time when it wasn't really feasible to openly show devotion to her. So you couldn't have a statue, but you could add her symbols to the space around you. And that would certainly point to periods in England's history when it wasn't safe to venerate Mary. And the zenith of her popularity was pretty much before the Reformation. And John Nicholl points out that the practice of using the M or VV for Mary peaked following the publication of Demonology in 1597. That said, Timothy Easton does point out that some of the letters originally appeared near statues and they later became useful themselves as apotropaic marks. So in this regard, they may have taken on protective associations because of where they were near. Incidentally, Perkins does point out that witch marks often appear in groups of three to harness the power of the Trinity. Another common symbol is the hexafoil or daisy wheel. So if you can kind of imagine like a circle with like a six petaled flower in it and you can make these with a pair of compasses. And I have done that for the image that was on the blog post because unfortunately I couldn't find any public domain images of a daisy wheel. So I just drew some because you know that's what you do. But no one truly knows what they mean because some people do think that they're a sun symbol. Other people see them associated with Apollo. Nobody really knows, so it's just conjecture. And they do apparently appear in English buildings from the early medieval period right up to the 19th century. They are most commonly found on stable doors or in agricultural settings, which again does make you wonder what their function would be. Some people think they might just be geometry exercises for apprentices. And that's why you would find them on stable doors where people you know, going in and out of this table would either be the horse or the horse hand. So therefore, it would be a safe place to put such marks. There could be a completely different reasoning behind them. As I say, we don't know. The most common theory is that they are protective marks and they do appear carved into stone or timber and even on furniture as well. 
Other than that, you also get marks that resemble boxes or mazes, and they were believed to trap evil. And the mesh or grid is sometimes referred to as a Jacob's ladder. Now, experts do disagree as to their function, although it is possible that these were intended as spirit traps. And this is something that Wayne Perkins talked about in his talk, because there is a belief that the spirit would get so fascinated by tracing the straight lines over and over again that it would keep it there, trapping it with the mark. Now, folklore would certainly bear this out, because... Ages and ages ago, right at the beginning of the podcast, I did the episode on corpse roads. And obviously in that one, we looked at the old belief that spirits can only travel in straight lines, which is one of the reasons why funeral processions actually followed meandering routes to prevent the dead returning home with the family. Now, the simple devices of straight lines would essentially keep the spirits transfixed and that would prevent them from wreaking havoc on the living. And in my head, it's kind of like the spiritual equivalent of giving them an iPad and just getting them to be quiet in the corner. We are going to move on from there because obviously I do realise that we're already kind of hitting the 15 minute mark at this point. But there is so much more to cover and we're going to because why not? And let's be honest, I mean, if if this goes on for twice the time, it's still only half an hour. So it's not like I'm keeping you here for three days. But anyway, we are going to move on from apotropaic marks to types of material that were useful. And iron will not surprise you to be one of the metals that was commonly used as protective items. Iron has long been considered a metal capable of warding off the supernatural, particularly fairies. Iron knives were a good choice of item to have around the house because the sharp blade could also deter negativity. And the Lawshall cache from Suffolk was a collection of worn iron implements that were then hidden beneath a window. So again, it was this idea that whatever you use had to be worn out, had to be finished, couldn't be brand new. And again, it kind of bears like the marks of its use. Now, people might also boost their security defences in the fireplace by using an iron fireback. So obviously, if you're going to have someone coming down the chimney, really good way to stop anyone entering your house that way is to put an iron fireback in there. And there are actually images that I've seen in the book from the Spellbound exhibition where they had apotropaic marks added to them as well. So it's just kind of like adding extra boosts to the protective nature of them. Now, if you're going to use nails anywhere, it was best to use what was called a three-headed nail. And again, this is something that Owen Davies and Kerry Holbrook talk about. And these were iron nails with heads that were made using three hammer blows. And three, as always, is considered this magical and protective number. So if you combine that with the iron of the nails, these items really did pack quite a protective punch. As well as iron and things like that, you would also find clothing turning up in wall cavities, although it wasn't really in places where they could have been accidentally lost. Occasionally, things have been found in such a way that experts have wondered if they were just being used to like plug a draft or some kind of hole or something, but often it looks more like they've been deliberately placed there. And the clothes do include coats, breeches, hats, corsets and gloves. Now, I would argue when you look at that particular list of items, while yes, whenever they've been found most recently, people have often confused them for like a pile of rags and they've only just avoided being thrown out. But I think those particular types of items are a little bit more sturdy and they are kind of more likely to last. So if you want something to have a protective function, then an item that's going to last the test of time, as it were, is obviously a better choice than something that's going to kind of fall apart quite easily. Davies and Hulbrook explain that homeowners may have placed these items during renovations since they're often found in floor voids or near hearths. And like everything else, they were always used and worn out. There were never anything new. Diana Eastop notes that worn clothing may have been used because of the fact that it bore the impressions and marks of its wearer. I would also argue that it's also absorbed some of their bodily fluids, even if it's just in the form of sweat. So again, that might explain why they were used as worn clothing. Shoes are also common, usually found under floors, in walls or roof spaces or near chimneys and it's nearly always one of a pair and again they are always worn and old and like the clothes it has been believed that builders added them during renovations rather than them being added at the point that the house was actually built and again no one knows why you would do this. So Davies and Hulbrook note that because the shoes mould themselves to the wearer again they bear traces of their presence so did this make them ideal as a protective item because it would then link the building and its occupants so it's kind of a way of casting your mark on the house as it were. Children's shoes might have been chosen because they were more powerful for deterring evil spirits because of this association with childhood and innocence. June Swan, however, does theorise that they may have provided a form of sacrificial offering, but again, without further research, we'll never really know. 
And this is the problem. There's such a lack of records, which makes it almost impossible for us to ever know why people concealed clothes and shoes in the first place. So Eastop does point out that people might not have recorded their cash for fear of it being discovered, which makes perfect sense, because that would render it far less effective for home protection purposes. And she does also make the point that through a form of metaphor, people were essentially clothing the body of their home, again for protective purposes. Now, finding a corset or a shoe is actually probably quite, you're like, all right, that's fine, that's cool. And they do also sometimes have to narrowly avoid being thrown out. But one of the things that I think people have discovered where you would be a little bit more freaked out are animal parts that are sometimes hidden around houses. So renovations within chimneys do sometimes reveal animal hearts that have been stuck with pins and they mostly date to the 19th century. But the most common theory for their existence is that they belong to farm animals such as pigs, sheep, cows or horses and that when they die, apparently as a result of witchcraft, their owners would remove their hearts and they would pierce them with pins and then roast them and then they would put them in cavities within the chimney. And Owen Davies and Kerry Hulbrook explain that this may have been intended to protect other animals from the same fate in a form of sympathetic magic. Horse bones are possibly one of the the two animals most often associated with concealed animal parts and it's usually the skull, leg bones or jaw bones. And at Toad Hall in Cheshire, an entire horse skeleton was actually found under the threshold. And the skull of a horse that actually had two boar tusks inserted into its tooth sockets was found in the wall of a rectory on the Isle of Man. And research showed that the skull dated to the original building's construction, which does rather imply that the builders added it during construction rather than later on. Yvonne Hayhurst notes the occasional use of a horse's skull under each of the four corners of a house's foundations. And in this particular instance with the rectory, the reconstruction of the other three walls of the building over time might explain why only one of them seems to remain. That said, because the skull was found in the north wall and people have linked the direction of north with the arrival of evil, it is possible that there was only one skull to start with and it was in the wall that really needed a little bit of extra protection. As for why the horse was so valuable as a protective device, well, the horse is a valuable animal to start with. They've generally got quite positive connotations. Obviously, they're strong, so they may have been used for these kind of protective qualities. There is, of course, no written evidence to explain the use of horse bones within the home. I mean, there are some really weird theories about the idea of them being put underneath floors to sort of enhance the acoustic properties, although there are various arguments as to why that's a really weird idea and how somebody would know to do that in the first place. But that said, other horse skulls have been found in Sweden, Finland and Ireland and the Swedish example may offer an explanation because there was a document attached to that one and it did explain the horse skull in a fireplace was there to guard against fire. Now it wasn't just animal parts found within walls that's the issue, the other one is mummified cats. So cats and horses are generally the things that people are most familiar with I think as apotropaic items and some people think that the cats were actually just cats that got stuck in holes and couldn't get free although Brian Hoggard does point out that surely if this were to happen the smell that would be caused by this would lead people to investigate so it's unlikely so if you are sitting there going oh no I hope that mummified cat wasn't one that just got caught in the wall let's be honest cats if they get stuck somewhere can always get back out again so it's unlikely and again somebody would go oh my god what's that smell they would probably also hear it meowing so it is more likely that these cats were actually deliberately concealed. In some cases, they've actually been found posed with like wire holding them in certain positions and it looks like they're chasing a mummified rat that's usually found with them. This has led people to suggest that they may have acted like spiritual scarecrows to keep down vermin in the house. And obviously, like rats and mice in this, in these times were not just vermin because they could have also been witches familiars. And indeed, Hoggard does suggest that having a scarecrow cat could have also warded off feline familiars as well. So one of these mummified cats could really ward off a whole range of evil spirits from familiars and then also ward off real life vermin as well. Now, so far, we're very much focused on how to keep evil spirits and fairies and witches and what have you out the house. But they were not the only problem facing the homeowner of days gone by. Because let's be honest, if you live in a wooden building, one of the things that's more likely to be a problem with your house is fire and lightning. And they do pose really real risks if you live in a wooden building. So it's unsurprising that people did search for ways to deter lightning. Now, I have looked at this before, like people putting acorns on windowsills and things like that, so I'm not going to cover these here. 
But what I am going to cover is the so-called thunderstones, which is one of the best words ever, which have been found hidden under the eaves, under the stairs or underneath doorways as well. And as cool as they do sound, they are actually often prehistoric axe heads or even belemnite fossils. And people thought that there were the remains of a thunderbolt. So in this typical sense of sympathetic magic that you get, we think, oh, I want to ward a thing off. So I will use something that re- represents the thing I'm trying to ward off. So they obviously use these thunderstones to try and stop the houses being struck by lightning. Now, ultimately, we will never know for definite why people hid these items around their home and we'll never know why they carved apotropaic marks into the building's fabric, whether they were indeed apotropaic or not. We don't know. And writers contemporary to the practices certainly didn't write about folk magic or practices that were being done by the lower classes. So where the knowledge needed to create the marks has essentially faded from folk memory, we now have to do our best at recreating it with what we know now. And in some cases, when objects turn up during contemporary renovations, some people actually log them and then reconceal them. So you have to wonder, are these people preserving the history of the house or on some level do they fear what may happen if these objects are removed and then they reconceal them to sort of preserve their original function? So we do have to wonder how many people do continue to conceal items around their home for these protective reasons. What I should say in closing is that apotropaic marks are really easy to make if you want to get into it and a simple X or a saltire cross will do the trick and you can always fashion your own protective items although I'm not going to lie I really don't recommend digging up your floor to bury anything unless you're already doing some kind of building work around the house and who's to say if we all start making our own versions of witch bottles for example with whatever modern things we have now. Imagine the fun and japes that they'll be in about 200 years time when people start discovering them. I think that'll be quite funny. So as I said at the beginning of the episode, if you are interested in folklore about home protection, and that's from more of like a folkloric point of view, then please do remember you can sign up for updates below and get my free PDF guide about it. And if you are a little bit more witchcraft inclined, then I would recommend a book called By Rust of Nail and Prick of Thorn, The Theory and Practice of Effective Home Warding by Althea Sebastiani. And that's all about home protection for witches. And it's really interesting. And it's also fairly inexpensive. And there's a link to that below as well. So that is the end of this week's episode. I do apologise that it has been a little bit longer than usual, but I'm sure you can appreciate the sheer amount of content that's in there. It kind of needed to be. Now, originally next week, I was going to have a look at kind of amulets and protective things that people would do for their bodies. And we are still going to do that, but just not next week. I've decided to push that back a week because I suddenly remembered, obviously, next weekend is Valentine's Day weekend. And obviously last year I did do the episode on sort of sinister Valentine's folklore and vinegar Valentine's and things like that. So instead, I decided I would focus on kind of charms and things that people have done over the years and over the ages to either find love or even repel love in some cases so I thought that would be quite an interesting thing to have a look at so we are kind of sticking with almost like the folk magic theme for February so I hope that you enjoy that so as I say we'll be getting back to protection the week after but next week we're going to have a look at all things love spell and stuff like that so I hope that you enjoyed that I'm not going to add a whole load of blather on the end because obviously this has been a longer episode than usual Without any further ado, because obviously you've got stuff to do, so I'll I'll be away and I'll see you next week. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.